So this is the uh, chapter on sound. We're going to take a look at uh, what sound is um, in terms of a wave propagates with energy, propagates with momentum. And we're also gonna look at some different applications. So uh, it's a very long chapter. We uh, probably won't spend very much time at the end of it, which uh, deals with uh, musical instruments, but we'll spend most of uh, our work really concentrating on what sound waves are, how humans perceive sound, and some um, other uh, aspects of, uh, of sound. So first of all, sound is a wave. A wave is any disturbance that can propagate. And uh, sound is a special type of wave. It's a mechanical wave, which means it involves the motion of some medium in order to propagate. And um, you know, here's an example of a wave. This is a surface wave on the ocean. Um, it carries with it again, energy. Uh, obviously these waves can erode away our coast and uh, carries with it momentum. If this wave crashes into you, uh, as I'm sure anybody who's been down to the beach knows, uh, the momentum uh, can be pretty significant. So um, waves, disturbances that carry both uh, momentum and energy that can come in forms where there's just a single disturbance of wave pulse, or they can be continuous waves where they repeat themselves over and over again. In terms of describing a wave, we can describe the amount of disturbance as the amplitude. Now, if a wave is traveling through a medium, and most waves will travel through a medium, any mechanical wave has to travel through a medium, <coughs> the medium itself will have an equilibrium state. It'll have a state where, you know, if it's the surface of the water, the water will be nice and calm, you know, glassy and reflecting the, the light very, very well. Uh, whereas on a choppy day where there are a lot of waves out there, uh, the height of the, the water will vary very greatly. There'll be some peaks, there'll be some troughs. The difference between equilibrium and a peak or the difference between equilibrium and a trough is what we call the amplitude. So uh, if we talk about how tall are the waves on the ocean on a particular day? If you go down to the ocean, you know, you know, calm day, they'll have one to two foot swells on a really um, stormy day. You know, the swells can be as large as six feet. Well, what they're giving you there is the amplitude. Um, as I talk right now, I'm disturbing the air around me. And the more I disturb it, the more I disturb the pressure and, and the density, the greater the amount of the amplitude. Light waves, the brighter the light, greater the amplitude. So we talk about amplitude, it talks about whatever we're traveling through, how much do we disrupt the way it normally is if it's completely undisturbed. This is the 2004 tsunami, um, a very devastating tsunami in Indonesia that, oh, I don't know why it's jumping around that um, was uh, created by a um, converging fault. And uh, basically Indonesia is extremely uh, active volcanically and, um, and seismically because of this converging fault. And one day it slipped a tremendous amount. And uh, when it rebounded, it pushed up the water and generated the tsunami. So here you can actually see this map showing um, again, very devastating to uh, this region right here around Indian, Indonesia. Um, but as you got further and further away, the energy dissipated. Although even Australia got some, and um, I think there was even a fatality in Ethiopia. Uh, but again, the different colors represent the amplitude of that tsunami at different locations. How much was the water disturbed? So amplitude is the amount of disruption. Uh, the greater the amplitude, the, the more um, the medium is going to be uh, displaced or disrupted or, or changed. Now, wavelength talks about a different property of the waves. If you go down to the ocean, you can see the waves aren't right on top of one another. In fact, they're, they're spaced apart 
um, not evenly, but you know, fairly periodically, okay? The distance from one peak to the next peak can be thought of as the wavelength, okay? These are continuous waves that keep going on forever. The wavelength represents either the, the distance between a peak and a peak, a valley and a valley, or basically the distance it takes a wave to repeat itself. Now, some situations like the surface waves on the ocean don't necessarily have a very regular peak, okay? Um, some peaks are taller, some peaks are shorter, some are spaced apart more, some are spaced apart less. So it's harder to define a wavelength there. However, when we talk about things like light waves, which are electromagnetic waves, the distance it takes the electric field to repeat itself, or sound waves, the distance that the pressure goes from high to low and back to high. Um, what other type of, of, of waves can we talk about? Uh, in seismic waves, the distance between where the earth is compressed, it's rarefied and then compressed again. All of these represent what is it doing in terms of uh, distance wise at any point in time, how is it repeating itself? Now we will find out that the wavelength of audible sound waves, because after all, this is a chapter about sound, is anywhere from 1.7 centimeters to 17 meters in terms of the wavelength, okay? Visible light, light that you can see with your eyes, there the, wave is, the wavelength is much, much smaller. In fact, um, it is anywhere from about a third of a micron to about three quarters of a micron, okay? Um, and we typically measure light in nanometers or we measure it in microns. What they're talking about is, what is the distance from one peak to the next peak, okay? Where the electric field is pointing one direction, it'll switch, then it'll oscillate back again. What is that, that dis difference there? Now, later on in the course, we will get to electromagnetic radiation, radio waves, microwaves, infrared, visible, ultraviolet X-rays and gamma rays. The amazing thing for the wavelength of visible light, it varies anywhere from a wavelength in kilometers for radio waves, centimeters for microwaves, uh, micrometers for infrared, nanometers for visible, ultraviolet and x-rays, and even smaller units like pico and femtometers for gamma rays. It has a huge variation in wavelength. For what we do, most of the wavelengths in sound will be anywhere from a couple centimeters to a few meters. Not that great of a variation. Period. Wavelength is the distance between peaks, the distance between valleys, whereas period is the time it will take a wave to repeat itself over again. Not all waves are periodic, but the waves that are periodic, that period represents a time. So for instance, um, if we're thinking about, um, Oh gosh, what would it be a good one? 100 Hertz waves. That means that the oscillate 100 times per second, all right? That's pretty much on the low end of, of what your ears can hear. What that means is the period is 1 100th of that, or 1 100th of a second, okay? 10 milliseconds if you wanna use metric prefixes. And period is very much related to frequency. The frequency asks, how many oscillations per second do you have? The period asks, how many oscillations, I'm sorry, how long does it take each oscillation to take place? Here's a graph of a wave as a function of time for a higher frequency and a lower frequency. Notice for the high frequency wave, it oscillates a lot in the same given time period. That means that the period of the wave, the distance in time or the time between when we see a, a valley or a valley or a peak and a peak is very short. So as frequency goes up, period goes down. As the period becomes longer, the frequency becomes smaller. Here's a lower frequency wave. The period is much longer here. And what that means is you will have less oscillations for the same given amount of time, okay? So high frequency, one, two, three, four, five, six, six peaks, six oscillations. Low frequency, three. So this is 
twice the period for the low frequency and one half the, the, uh, the frequency. Now the SI units for frequency, I used it before, are named after Heinrich Hertz. He was the one who discovered electromagnetic waves and uh, showed that they could propagate across the room. So we, in his name, named the uh, Hertz in his honor. In frequency, um, there are also other units of frequency that we oftentimes use. Kilohertz, megahertz, gigahertz, even terahertz are used simply using the metric prefixes. Now we hear best at 5,000 Hertz, okay? That's 5,000 oscillations per second. To our ears, that sound very, very high pitch, but actually because of our ear canal, unless we have any hearing damage, that's where our hearing actually peaks. If we want to calculate the period from this frequency, they're just the inverse of one another. So one over 4,000 Hertz tells us that we have an oscillation period of 0 0.00025 seconds, okay? Or a quarter of a millisecond. So once again, every second that goes by with a 4,000 Hertz oscillation, 4,000 Hertz sound wave, every second that goes by, we experience 4,000 vibrations, 4,000 oscillations. How long is each oscillation? One quarter of a millisecond, okay? That's the relationship between the two. Electrical power oscillates about um, with a period of 0 0.0167 seconds. We can calculate the frequency from this. And not surprisingly, one over 0 0.0167 gives us 60 Hertz. 60 Hertz is actually regulated by the government for all our, our power supply. And um, originally it was used to keep track of time because all the power grids were synchronized to the 60 Hertz uh, oscillation, um, it was very easy to convert these oscillations into a meaningful time. Now there is a relationship between different frequencies and different units of period. One kilohertz is 1000 Hertz. It has a period of one millisecond or 10 to the minus three Hertz. Megahertz, million oscillations per second, has the equivalent period of one microsecond, okay? Um, or one millionth of a hertz. Gigahertz is a billion oscillations per second. One nanosecond is a billionth of a second. Terahertz, one trillion oscillations per second. Picosecond, one trillionth of a hertz. So you see the connection between the two. And if you do a lot with electronics and computers, you'll know that certain memory actually has response times, which is measured in the nanoseconds. Why is that important? Because the clock time for many uh, computers for the microprocessor is measured in gigahertz. So if your clock is operating with oscillations, there's actually an oscillating signal that, that causes it to do different uh, digital operations. If you're operating the gigahertz range, your memory has to respond within the nanosecond range. So that's the, the overlap between those two. So let's talk about hearing. Let's talk about um, sound. Humans with perfect hearing can sense frequencies from 20 to 20,000 Hertz. Now don't get your hearing test and get all upset because you don't reach 20,000 Hertz. I just tested my own hearing not too long ago, and it says 16,000 Hertz is my upper range. Should I be concerned? Well, not really. Given my age, it's natural that you lose the highest frequency part of the spectrum first, okay? Actually, for my age, 16,000 Hertz is not too bad for a middle-aged guy, okay? It's that 20 Hertz that you only have when you're a very young child. As you get older, the nerves become less sensitive and hearing damage can even accelerate that. Typically people with hearing loss tend to lose the higher frequencies first and we'll talk about why that happens. Once again, the easiest frequency to hear is about 4,000 Hertz. What can you hear? Anywhere from 20 Hertz to 20,000 Hertz, but be careful here. 20 Hertz is a very difficult sound to hear. 
it has to be very, very loud for you to hear it. Whereas we can see down here, 4,000 Hertz is a very easy sound to hear. This is a logarithmic scale and it shows the difficulty with which a sound can be heard, okay? The higher these, these contours here, okay? And these are loudness levels, the higher these contour levels, the more difficult it is for your sound to, for you to hear the sound. And again, I can hear right about up to here. If you have perfect hearing, you could hear, you know, to 20,000 Hertz, but I don't think we have any infants taking this, this course. So if you could hear 20,000 Hertz, that's pretty, that's pretty remarkable, if not uh, inhuman. Um, dogs, cats, other animals can hear much higher frequencies than we can. That's just the way that it works. Let's talk about the geometries of waves. Mechanical waves and most waves come into two basic geometries, longitudinal waves and transverse. The two waves that we study in this course are either sound waves, which are longitudinal, or transverse waves, which would be electromagnetic waves like light. Now, when I'm talking toward the microphone, I'm pushing the sound forward and backward, um, or I'm pushing the air molecules forward and backward, and in doing so, I'm creating this longitudinal wave. Sound waves are compression of air, compression and rarefication, which propagates in all directions. Because the oscillation is in the direction of travel, we call this a longitudinal wave. Transverse waves like light don't behave like that. There, when the light wave is going forward, the oscillation, the electric field and the magnetic field are perpendicular to the direction they're going. So they're called transverse waves. And there's our electromagnetic wave um, represented by different lines. But again, you can see it's going from top corner to the bottom corner along this white arrow, but the actual oscillations are perpendicular 90 degrees to that white arrow. Here's our longitudinal wave. And again, this is what's called the driver. We like to call them speakers, but speakers actually contain drivers. So a little electromagnetic, um, so you call it, would you call it an actuator? Maybe, which forces this cone forward and backward and compresses and rarefies the air. These disturbances propagate in all directions, much like the ripples in a lake when I drop a, a pebble in it, you know, propagate in all directions. This will create a similar disturbance which propagates. When it reaches my ear, it pushes on my eardrum, forcing it forward and backward. And that allows me to actually sense the hearing. Well, let's skip through this. Um, sound waves basically propagate in all directions. When we're very close to a small sound source, the waves appear to be spherical. As they propagate further and further, they tend to flatten out and become a planar wave there are even some waves that are shaped cylindrically. How fast does sound travel? Well, that really depends on how warm it is. When it's warmer out, the molecules are moving faster. When it's colder out, the molecules move slower. The speed of sound is actually very close to the average speed of the molecules of air. So as it gets warmer, the molecules move faster. They can propagate this, this disturbance much faster. When it cools down, the molecules go slower, thus the propagation doesn't happen as rapidly. So the speed of wave depends on the medium. You heat the medium up, such as for air, the sound waves are going to go faster and faster. Let's look at some different uh, waves. Typically, the uh, wave on a string instrument, a little transverse wave, if I pluck a guitar string, or violin string, it's gonna go up and down the length of the string at 100 meters per second or over 220 miles per hour. It's pretty fast. However, sound travels even faster than that. Sound travels anywhere from 30, 331 meters per second if it's freezing out up to about 340 meters per second for the case where we're close to room temperature, okay? So converting that into miles per hour, it's roughly just a little under 700 miles per hour in, in most cases. 
It actually travels faster through water because the water molecules are more tightly packed and there it travels about 1400 meters per second. But don't fool yourself. Even though the speed of sound is very, very fast, it's nowhere close to the speed of sound. I'm sorry, the speed of light. The speed of light is 300 million meters per second, okay? If you look at that, that's nearly a million times faster than the speed of sound. So if you're watching a thunderstorm, it's not surprisingly that you see the flash first and then you hear the sound second. In fact, we can use the difference in speed to um, estimate how far away it is. See this, how um, sound travels at about 330, uh, 331 meters per second. That means it roughly travels one kilometer every three seconds. If you don't like kilometers, you can convert that to miles. Roughly about um, one mile for every five seconds. So next time you see a thunderstorm, look at the flash and then count 1,001, 1,002, 1,003. That time difference will tell you how far away it is. It takes five seconds to, for the sound to arrive. It's a mile away, nothing to worry about. It takes one second to arrive. Well, that's two tenths of a mile away. Not as far as it was before. If you see the flash and hear the sound at the same time, you hit right nearby. There's no time difference um, when uh, you're close to where it struck. Okay. Air is made mostly out of nitrogen and oxygen. Um, if you breathe helium, helium is a slightly lighter gas. It goes faster and you'll actually hear a higher uh, frequency due to this higher speed. But um, generally, air molecules are uh, nitrogen and oxygen. Uh, diatomic nitrogen has a molecular mass of 28. Diatomic oxygen is about a molecular mass of 32. There's some water vapor in there, some argon. But um, generally, the lighter the gas, the faster the speed of sound. Um, important. Uh, phenomena that occur in um, waves. Interference is one of the most important. There's something called the superposition principle that if you have two waves like this green one and this red one, and you add them together, you simply take the displacement of each and take the sum of the two. So anytime we have a peak and a peak, that'll produce a bigger peak. Anytime we have a valley and a valley, we add those two together, we get a bigger valley. Constructive interference allows two waves to build an even bigger wave. Um, constructive interference uh, is you know, common if you have more than one speaker on a sound system. We always have to worry about um, you know, really bright spots at different frequencies. Constructive interference also occurs in musical instruments where we only amplify or have constructive interference for certain frequencies producing the notes that we hear. Destructive interference happens when two waves line up such that a peak lines up with a valley and a valley lines up with a peak. If you have noise canceling headphones, this actually uses this principle of cancellation or destructive interference to take out ambient noise. It works well for some frequencies, doesn't work as well for higher frequencies. So you can get rid of most of the low frequency noise. How does it do this? Well, let's say that this top wave represents the sound coming in. This second wave represents a digitally created wave that is produced by an external microphone. It'll invert the sound and then play it back to your ear. So the two waves cancel each other out and you don't hear any outside noise. Basically, all you'll hear is whatever the headphones play for you. And it can cancel out most of that extraneous noise. But again, constructive and destructive interference are a real problem with sound. You'll see multiple speakers used in a theater or in any type of sound system to take out these, these dead zones. Dead zones occur for certain frequencies where destructive interference would otherwise cancel out the waves, okay? And remember, it's very much sensitive to the frequency. 
dead zones are more likely for higher frequencies and lower frequencies. Um, well, probably mid to high frequencies because that's where the interference um, you know, happens on a scale of a typical auditorium. So acoustically, we, again, we want to engineer uh, you know, the reflections, the absorption of sound, and even the speakers themselves such that we don't get um, dead zones. All right, sound waves. As we said, sound waves are disturbances in the air. They are pressure and density waves. And um, we can generate them by simply either compressing the air or stretching the air, what we call rarefication. If we were to visualize what the air molecules were doing, we would sort of see these places of higher density and lower density, as is shown in this upper demonstration right here. Molecules, of course, are too small to see. So um, this is not a realistic representation. But again, we would see in some places the air pressure would drop, some places the air pressure would go up, drop, go up, and drop. Now, infrasonic waves are waves that are too low in frequency for our ears to detect. Any sound below 20 hertz, um, our ears are not made to hear that. Again, other animals have a larger range of frequency than we have, but we have 20 to 20,000 hertz. You ever have trouble remembering that? Think of 2020 vision. Well, this is 2020 hearing. You can hear from 20 to 20,000 hertz. Sound below 20 hertz, even though it cannot be heard, can actually be felt. In fact, subwoofers, which are large drivers, oftentimes used in sound systems, will create a, um, you know, a, a, a sound wave powerful enough, but low in frequency enough for the pressure nerves in our skin to actually feel it. It actually also creates a resonance in our chest cavity, which we can also feel. So oftentimes we will introduce frequencies too low for us to hear into sound to give us that tactile feel, to, to give us that, that, um, that low frequency response that we can't hear, but that we can feel. Above 20,000 Hertz, we can't hear those. Well, above 16,000 Hertz, I can't hear it. But anything above 20,000 Hertz is considered to be ultrasonic. These sound waves can be used to image inside the human body. Now I can look around the room using light waves because I can see where the light waves are coming, how they bounce off different things, and basically create an image of what's going on around me. Okay, again, that's possible because the waves, the light waves bouncing off everything, give me the information I need to understand what this room is like, even if I don't actually walk around it. We can do the same with sound waves. Using a, what's called a piezoelectric crystal, we can bounce ultrasonic waves off of the inside of the human body. And as the waves will refract, which means the bend, or reflect, bounce off different parts of our interior, we can actually reconstruct an image from that. Now, ultrasound is not as good in terms of resolution as X-rays, but the nice thing about ultrasound is unlike X-rays, it's not ionizing radiation. It's not harmful to biological tissue at the frequencies and the intensities that are used to image inside the body. That's why it's excellent for actually looking inside human body when somebody is pregnant. You can actually image the fetus without uh, introducing it to ionizing radiation, which can cause birth defects. Let's talk about audible waves. <laughs> what can we hear? 20 to 20,000 hertz. These sound waves, when we hear them, actually enter the ear canal through this outer part of the ear, okay, which you probably have unless you're Van Gogh, chopped off his ear. Um, uh, the pinna on the outside basically is almost like a funnel and it allows the sound waves to transition from the open space on the outside to the closed space of the ear canal. Now without this ear, this transitioning would be very different, difficult and most of the sound would actually be reflected away from the ear canal. With this, we're able to, again, transition between the two regions 
and most of the sound actually makes it in there. So don't underestimate the importance of the outside of the ear. Once in the ear canal, the sound waves make their way to the eardrum. The eardrum is mechanical. The pressure waves will push the eardrum forward and backward. They are then connected to the malleus, okay, which is connected to the incus. These act like a lever. This will actually amplify the motion. And then finally, the stapes is connected to the oval window of the cochlea, and that's where the actual nerves to hear are. Okay, so again, 20 to 20,000 hertz. Those are the sounds that are going to um, be detected. Again, the sound waves are turned into mechanical movement. The mechanical movement is sent to the, the cochlea. The cochlea then turns it into um, nerve impulses, which are then sent to the brain. Now, inside the cochlea, it's actually a very complex um, organ. You know, you think, well, it just has a bunch of nerve cells and the nerve cells turn sound into nerve impulses. It's actually much more complex than that. The vibrations create pressure waves within the fluid, which is in the cochlea. In fact, the cochlea is also attached to the semicircular canals, which are responsible for your balance. They also use moving fluid, um, but rather than detect sound, they detect any type of motion. But in any case, back to the cochlea. There are two channels within the cochlea where the fluid travels in one direction in the first channel and travels in the other direction, the second direction, the other way. So we can see the fluid coming in, we can see the fluid going out. Again, this is oscillatory motion. So it's not flowing as much as it's shifting forward and backward. As it moves back and forth, the movement of the fluid creates a well, fluid dynamic effect, almost like an aerodynamic effect. It creates almost like lift on this center region right here. Now here is the fluid traveling in one direction that's going into the cochlea. Here's the fluid down here, traveling the other direction, going the other way. And in between it, there's this region which is being pulled and pushed with time. This, in fact, will also cre create um, another lever system in inside here uh, where you have these hair cells which are connected to this tectorial membrane, which will actually move up and down as this, um, this region is, is pushed and pulled on, okay? So as the hair cells are tugged on, they send nerve impulses, uh, to the cochlear nerve fibers, and these are sent to the brain where they're processed. Okay, so that's how we hear. Once again, the sound wave enters the ear, hits the eardrum, hits, you know, moves the three bones, which are attached to the cochlea. The fluid inside the cochlea oscillates back and forth. Those oscillations are recorded by the nerve cells and then sent to the brain for processing. Generating sound. To produce sound again, we have to produce a disturbance, okay? If I move a surface toward air, it's gonna compress the air. If I move a surface away from air, the air is gonna have more volume, it's going to rarefy. So we can compress and rarefy the air and generate a wavefront by doing this, okay? This driver right here uses two magnets, a permanent magnet and an electromagnet, which I send a signal through. As I send the polarity in one direction, it forces the speaker forward. As I send in the other direction, it pulls the speaker back. So when this vibrates at different frequencies, there's an electronic signal that is trying to match the sound wave it's, it's going to produce, moving the driver forward and backward. Now speakers, which are, we use to play music or use for um, listening to sound of any, any sort, convert these electric signals into audio waves uh, using the system of drivers. We actually have three drivers here, and then we have this passive radiator right here, which uses the back end of the driver. It's a big hollow cavity in there. In the, um, 
really uh, amplifies the lowest frequency of, of sound waves. So this little driver right here um, is typically made out of a very fast vibrating driver, sometimes a piezoelectric crystal, similar to what we have in, in ultrasound probes. Here you have a medium frequency driver, and then this low end driver, which also has this resonating cavity um, to generate the lower frequencies. So division of labor, high frequency, medium frequency, and low frequency. And again, here's just some cutaways. Here's the permanent magnet behind it. Here's the voice coil or the, the electromagnet, which is gonna be drawn into the permanent magnet and pushed out. There's a suspension that holds the cone, which is gonna move the air. And um, basically these driver cones, I'm not gonna get into you know, too much detail here. There's something called a harmonic oscillator, which um, oscillates at a particular frequency based on its mass and uh, its elast elastic properties. But, um, oh, it's not a good, uh, not a good thing. But basically, the speaker can be thought of as a harmonic oscillator that vibrates back and forth, which is generally good over a range of frequencies. Now, um, better higher end speakers will have different drivers which are made to operate at different frequencies. So they can cover the whole um, uh, dynamic frequency range at which you listen to. Now, again, um, if we map the entire range of frequencies that our ear can hear from the most quiet sound to the sound that actually uh, induces pain in our ears, what we call the threshold of pain. And on the x-axis here, we have the range of frequency from lowest to highest. We don't really use um, most of the dynamic range of our hearing, okay? When we're on the phone, typically the quality of sound is not so good. That's because when we communicate, we only need a very narrow range of frequencies and intensities to communicate, okay? When we want to listen to music, we want better quality because the dynamic range of music is higher than that. So multiple drivers will um, be used to, to produce multiple frequencies. The amplifier takes weaker electric currents and amplifies them to produce a stronger signal, basically does most of the heavy lifting here. It is what takes the, the weak, um, you know, a signal, electric signal that might be coming from your cell phone, if you got it synced to your um, home audio system or coming from your television. It amplifies that to a large enough um, intensity that, um, you know, you can fill the entire room with sound. Now, originally amplifiers used uh, vacuum tubes, but um, we now use uh, transistors and transistors are Oh gosh, one of the most revolutionary devices in, in recent, in uh, you know, recent modern times. Um, they made it possible to not only amplify weaker signals, and became the. Um, they also are the basis for the uh, computer. Now skip transistors again. Amplifying a weak signal to a strong signal is very very important in um, you know generating sound. Car stereos have their own amplifiers. If you have a real high-end system, which I do not, um, you might notice that um, it has these uh, fins on it. That's because uh, with these amplifier systems, uh, they convert the electrical energy that's coming into it into uh, an output signal that's gonna drive the speakers. And then it's not 100% efficient. Quite a bit of energy is actually lost as waste heat. So these uh, amplifiers actually have to radiate this uh, way. If you've never seen one of these, um, you're not a, you know, a audiophile or a car system audiophile um, because most of these are found in very high end systems. 
Smaller devices, um, obviously just use smaller um, transistors to amplify the signal. But again, they don't have to generate as much sound because you're really just pumping the sound directly into the ear canals. In terms of the history of sound, how we generate sound, uh, Thomas Edison um, you know, developed one of the first usable phonographs. And uh, this was basically just a, um, a stylus which would ride in a, uh, the grooves cut into this hard wax. And uh, you'd speak into it right here that pushed the stylus up and down on the, uh, the hard wax. And then you could actually play it back because the stylus would ride it in these grooves and um, cause this diaphragm to move up and down. Later on, they connected large cones to it and eventually used a disc rather than a cylinder. Um, the uh, mechanical diaphragm was replaced with an electronic needle where instead of having the needle and the diaphragm generate the sound, the needle will create an electronic signal and then that would be amplified. <laughs> Eventually we went from wax to vinyl for very good reasons. First of all, wax um, is a softer material. It wears out fairly quickly. Um, even though they were using a fairly hard wax to do this, uh, you kept playing it, the sound would get worse and worse. With vinyl records, we didn't usually cut the grooves in the vinyl directly, although that could be done. You could actually take a disc and, and cut the grooves in there. Instead, what they would do is they record the sound and then they would use um, a stylus to cut into a metal disc and then use that metal disc to press into the vinyl. Um, vinyl records are actually making a comeback because uh, purists say that uh, because they're, they record sounds analog, um, they're very, very close to the original sound which produces it, and that digital is actually um, processed, so it's, it's not as, uh, as uh, true. Uh, but of course, the problem with records is every time you scratch this vinyl, you create, uh, you know, different popping and hissing noise that uh, takes away from the quality. Magnetic tape players came about a little bit after the phonograph. The first ones used um, wire and they would record a magnetic signal on the wire. Um, eventually, the uh, steel wire that was used was replaced with uh, cellph cellophane uh, tape um, where we would take uh, iron oxide powder and, and put it on the cellophane. Um, Cellulose, cellulose acetate. Uh, this was fine. Uh, the only problem with the cellulose acet acetylene uh, was twofold. You've heard the term ce ce celluloid, okay? That's what they're talking about, cellulose ac acetylene. Uh, one, it would oxidize and would become brittle, so it could actually break. Uh, two, it was extremely flammable, cellulose ac acetylene. Um, unfortunately, was also used for many different movies. And um, some of the most famous movies, which were stored on um, you know, celluloid, were actually lost uh, in fires when um, different movie companies lost their, uh, their storage areas. The first tape music was done in uh, November 19th, 1939. Uh, ironically, this was a London Philharmonic Orchestra, which was recorded in uh, Ludwigshafen, Germany, and this happened right before World War II, so uh, they made it home right before the war. Uh, tape cassettes eventually replaced um, reel-to-reel uh, for the consumer market. Obviously, reel-to-reel -reel was still used for uh, recording, and uh, most um, most rec recording that was done professionally uh, was done on, on reel to reel, but much bigger uh, tape machines than this. <clears throat> the cassette, of course, was very convenient because 
they kept it, the tape in a well-protected uh, cassette. Um, but uh, the disadvantage is you had to rewind it after every use. Uh, so uh, that made it much more difficult to jump to the song that you wanted. A-track tapes, of course, are infamous for being um, big back in the 1970s. Uh, they were very similar to the cassette tape, but instead of uh, four tracks, which the cassette tape would have, it actually had eight tracks or, or eight different parts of the tape, which were reserved for a signal. Now for the cassette tape, it was two tracks of stereo when it was going in one direction then two tracks in the other direction. Uh, for eight track tapes, the tape would always go in the same direction and you would have eight different tracks, um, but of course only, uh, you know, four pairs of tracks, so four different programs. And again, studio tracks would also use these large um, reel-to-reel. Uh, they switched from cellulose acetylene to um, less flammable materials. I'm not sure uh, you know, what they, they use, but you know, polymers that were a little more uh, stable. And um, most recording was done on these four track reel to reels where they record four tracks simultaneously. And then they'd go back and, and engineer that to, to st a stereo um, a signal. But uh, the interesting thing here was they would actually record the music and literally they would uh, cut the tape and just tape it back together. And this is, this is how they would uh, basically put together a, quite a few musical tracks. Of course, you know, if you were recording like an orchestra, you just record the whole session through. And you wouldn't have many takes. Most professional musicians, however, uh, more popular music, they'd come in, they record over and over and over again. And they just splice the, the good tracks uh, together. Um, what was interesting is uh, looping, which is a very popular technique again. They would actually take um, literally a loop of this tape and run it across the room on a pulley and they'd then start the tape recorder and let it loop this you know, many, many feet to, to get a repeating sound over and over again. Now we can do this all electronically. Um, recording tapes are, are, are very easy to understand how they work. With vinyl records, it was the groove that would make the stylus vibrate back and forth. Those would produce um, uh, originally sound waves, but then the vibrations were turned into an electric signal. Um, with magnetic tapes, it's an oscillation of the magnetic field rather than um, the, uh, the surface. So when we record, we cause the magnetic particles to change the orientation to represent what the sound wave is doing. And when we play back, we use a magnet, we use a um, induction, we use a coil to induce currents to uh, generate the signal that we've recorded. And again, here is a, a, a tape where we're recording a signal on it. Normally, the uh, tape, when it's unmagnetized, all the magnetic domains are going every which direction. But um, again, we magnetize the tape according to a particular polarity to match what the sound is doing. And most of these recording systems had three uh, tape heads. There was an eraser head, which was just convenient if you wanted to wipe clean the, the tape. And so there's no um, interference pattern in the background, you'd have this little race head. Uh, there was a recording head, which would lay down the information and the playback head, which would use Faraday's law of induction to convert the magnetic field back into an output signal. So very easy. And um, this is the basis for, for hard drives these days, same thing. You, um, when you wanna write, you send a stronger electric uh, current through here and that imposes a magnetic field. When you want to read the information, you simply run this um, coil back over it. And instead of putting a signal in, Faraday's law of induction, you generate a signal out. 
microphones. This is a really old microphone. Uh, Emil Berliner and Thomas Edison filed patents for the first microphones within two weeks of each other. So they're both given credit for discovering the uh, microphone. And believe it or not, the first microphones were incredibly simple. Um, they were uh, carbon microphones. And um, let, me, let me draw this out. Let me show you uh, how they actually worked. Okay. And basically, you would have this little container of carbon. And on each side of the carbon, you would have um, basically a positive voltage. And on the other side, I'm trying to do this as neatly as possible, a negative voltage. Okay positive voltage and a negative voltage. And what would naturally happen is that um, electricity would flow through this. Oh, let me choose a different color. Undo that and choose a different color. Let me use yellow for this. Well, naturally the current would flow through this, go from um, positive to negative as current does. We'll talk about that later on. And if you didn't do anything to the microphone, you would just get this constant current, nothing really much would be happening. But as you spoke into this, the sound from your voice would compress the carbon, which would increase the current, so the voltage would go up. And then when there's rarefication, it pulled the carbon apart, increasing the resistance, and then the signal would go down. So the oscillation on top of this current would generate a signal which could then be amplified and then you could speak. So those were the first microphones. And um, again, uh, they were very, very simple. You had to be careful with them because they were always alive. There was a live current in it. And there are many instances where people get bad electrical shocks from them. Today's microphones um, you know, use a number of different techniques and they, they don't always need uh, to have live current going to them. Um, some use uh, capacitance instead of, um, you know, this resistive material. Some will use uh, the induction through, through a coil of wire, um, you know, very similar to a pickup that you might have in a, uh, an electric guitar, but instead of the wire vibrating above it, you have microphone di diaphragm vibrating above it and turning that into an electric signal, okay? Okay, 